All right, guys, Mr. D here. We're going to continue with our reading of Chapter 1 in The Great Gatsby. And so it happened that on a warm, windy evening, I drove over to East Egg to see two old friends whom I scarcely knew at all. Their house was even more elaborate than I expected, a cheerful red-and-white Georgian colonial mansion overlooking the bay. The lawn stretched at the beach and ran toward the front door for a quarter of a mile, jumping over sundials and brick walks and burning gardens. Finally, when it reached the house, drifting up the side in bright vines, as though from the momentum of its run. The front was broken by a line of French windows glowing now with reflected gold and wide open to the warm, windy afternoon, and Tom Buchanan, in riding clothes, was standing with his legs apart on the front porch. So I want to stop here for a second. Here we have a description of the Buchanan's house. Now you'll notice it's much different than the description of Gatsby's house. Gatsby's house um, was described as being much like the Hotel de Ville in Normandy, very elaborate. He talked about, you know, the spanking new ivy on the tower. Very new money. This is very old money. Still beautiful, still very, very nice, still very, very rich, but much more refined, much more elegant. Instead of being filigreed with towers and this and that and everything else, it has, you know, formal gardens, and it's a classic colonial mansion. Um, and look at the words that he uses to describe it, more diction, to give us some characterization here. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Bright vine, I don't know what I'm talking about. Bright, um, glowing, reflected gold, right? All these words kind of bring the uh, idea of richness into the mix. And um, then he talks about Tom Buchanan. And look at the way that Tom is standing. You know, legs apart on the front porch. Very much the owner of this domain. Okay? Let's look at the, um, the description of Tom here. He had changed since his New Haven years. Now he was a sturdy, straw-haired man of 30 with a rather hard mouth and supercilious manner. I'm gonna... The words that he's used to describe him. Two shining, arrogant eyes had established dominance over his face and gave him the appearance of always leaning aggressively forward. Not even the effeminate swank of his riding clothes could hide the enormous power of that body. He seemed to fill those glistening bolts, boots until he strained the top lacing and you could see a great pack of muscle shifting when his shoulder moved under his thin coat. It was a body capable of enormous leverage, a cruel body. So look at the diction used to describe Tom. Words like hard. Supercilious. Dominance. Aggressive. Enormous. Power. Great. Muscle. Leverage. Cruel. All right. This is all... Nick's perception of Tom. Right? Muscular, strong, powerful, rich, and seemingly aggressive, maybe even a little cruel. His speaking voice was a gruff, husky tenor added to the impression of fractiousness he conveyed. There was a touch of paternal contempt in it, even toward people his like, even toward people he liked, and there was men at New Haven who had hated his guts. Right? There were men at Yale where they went to school who hated him. 
Now, don't think my opinion on these matters is final. He seemed to say, just because I'm stronger and more of a man than you are. Right? Again, further perception of Nick. Tom isn't actually saying all of this. Okay? This is what the, the impression he seems to give off. We were in the same senior society, and while we were never intimate, I always had the impression that he liked me, that he approved of me, and wanted me to like him with some harsh, defiant wistfulness of his own. We talked for a few, mon a few minutes on the sunny porch. I've got a nice place here, he said, his eyes flashing about restlessly. Right? Again, remember, this isn't the first time that Tom describe, is described as restless. Turning me around by one arm, he moved a broad, flat hand across the front vista, including in its sweep a sunken Italian garden, a half an acre of deep, pungent roses, and a snub-nosed motorboat that bumped the tide offshore. It belonged to Domaine, the oil man. He turned me around again, politely and abruptly. We'll go inside. We walked through a high hallway into a bright, rosy-colored space, fragilely bound into the house by French windows at either end. The windows were ajar and gleaming white against the fresh grass outside that seemed to grow a little way into the house. A breeze blew through the room, blew curtains in at one end and out the other like pale flags, twisting them up toward the frosted wedding cake of the ceiling, and then rippled over the wine-colored rug, making a shadow on it as wind does on the sea. Again, look at the way he describes this place, right? The house, you know, a bright, rosy-colored place, maybe even fragile, right? Gleaming. Oop, why isn't this working? Gleaming. Fresh. Um, he says, you know, the frosted wedding cake of the ceiling, the wine-colored rug. Now, if we think of the houses that these characters live in, as reflections of themselves, we can ask ourselves, what does the description of the Buchanan's house Tell us about the Buchanans. Right? Think, look at these word choices. Beautiful, but maybe fragile. Right? Described in very luxurious um, terms. starting here. The only completely stationary object in the room was an enormous couch on which two young women were buoyed up as though upon... Oh, actually, before we even get into this, I also want to look it up here. Notice the way that he describes Tom as turning him this way, pulling him that way, moving him this way. This is how Tom deals with the world. Everything is like a piece that he moves around his own, you know, chessboard, so to speak. All right, starting here. The only completely stationary object in the room was an enormous couch on which two young women were buoyed up as though upon an anchored balloon. They were both in white, and their dresses were rippling and fluttering as if they had just been blown back in after a short flight around the house. I must have stood for a few minutes, listening to the whip and snap of the curtains and the groan of a picture on the wall. There was a boom as Tom Buchanan shut the rear windows and the caught wind died out about the room, and the curtain and all the rugs and the two young women ballooned slowly to the floor. So Tom literally taking the air out of the room. So to take the air out of room or suck the air out of room means to kind of like kill the atmosphere. And that's what Tom does. If he doesn't like something, he shuts it down. The younger of the two was a stranger to me. She extended, she was extended full length at her end of the divan, 
completely motionless and with her chin raised a little as if she were balancing something on it, which was quite likely to fall off. All right. She was extended full length. Her chin raised a little as if she were balancing something that's quite likely to fall off. Hmm. If she saw me out of the corner of her eye, she gave no hint. Indeed, I was almost surprised into murmuring an apology for having disturbed her by coming in. The other girl, Daisy, made an attempt to rise. She leaned slightly forward with a conscientious expression, and then she laughed, an absurd, charming little laugh, and I laughed too and came forward into the room. All right, so this, we will soon learn, is Jordan Baker, Daisy's best friend. All right, laying out there, literally with her nose up, and then there's Daisy. So pay attention to the words that describe these women, right? Absurd and charming, right? This is something that Daisy has about her, this alluring charm. I'm paralyzed with happiness. She laughed again as if she had said something very witty and held my hand for a moment, looking up into my face, promising that there was no one in the world so much she wanted to see. That was a way she had. How about that? She hinted in a murmur that the surname of the balancing girl was Baker. I've heard it said that Daisy's murmur was only to make people lean toward her, an irrelevant criticism that made it nonetheless charming. So again, here is Nick's perception of Daisy. At any rate, Miss Bicker's lips fluttered. She nodded at me almost imperceptibly and then quickly tipped her head back again. The object she was balancing had obviously tottered a little and given her something of a fright. Again, a sort of apology rose to my lips. Almost any exhibition of complete self-sufficiency draws a stunned tribute from me. I looked back at my cousin, who began to ask me questions in her low, thrilling voice. It was the kind of voice that the ear follows up and down as if each speech is an arrangement of notes that will never be played again. Her face was sad and lovely with bright things in it, bright eyes and a bright, passionate mouth. But there was an excitement in her voice that men who had cared for her found difficult to forget a singing compulsion, a whispered listen, a promise that she had done gay, exciting things just a while since, and that there were gay, exciting things hovering, hovering in the next hour. All right, next perception of Daisy here, next perception of Daisy there. I told her how I had stopped off in Chicago for a day on my way east, and how a dozen people had sent their love through me. Do they miss me? She cried ecstatically. The whole town is desolate. All the cars have their left rear wheel left rear wheel painted black as a morning wreath, and there's a persistent wail all night along the North Shore. <gasps> How gorgeous! Let's go back, Tom, tomorrow. And then she added irreverently, You ought to see the baby. I'd like to. She's asleep. She's only two years old. Haven't you ever seen her? Never. Well, you ought to see her. She's Tom Buchanan who had been hovering restlessly, there's that word again, about the room, stopped and rested his hand on my shoulder. And what I told you, when Tom's done with something, he wants it to end. What do you do, Nick? I'm a bond man. With who? I told him. Never heard of him, he remarked decisively. This annoyed me. You will, I answered shortly. You will if you stay in the East. Oh, I'll stay in the East, don't you worry. He said, glancing at Daisy and then back at me. Interesting. As if he were alert for something more, I'd be a goddamn fool to live anywhere else. At this point, Miss Baker said, absolutely, with such suddenness that I startled. It was the first word she uttered since I came into the room. Evidently, it surprised her as much as it did me, for she yawned with a series of rapid deft movements stood up into the room. Mm, I'm stiff, she complained. I've been lying on that sofa all. I've been lying on that sofa for as long as I can remember. Don't look at me, Daisy retorted. I've been trying to get you to New York all afternoon. <laughs> no thanks, said Miss Baker to the four cocktails just in for the pantry. I'm absolutely in training. Her host looked at her incredulously. You are? He took his own drink as if it were a drop in the bottom of a glass. How you ever get anything done is beyond me. 
I looked at Miss Baker, wondering what it was she got done. I enjoyed looking at her. She was a slender, small-breasted girl with an erect carriage, which she accentuated by throwing her body backward at the shoulders like a young cadet. Her gray, sun-strained eyes looked back at me with polite reciprocal curiosity out of a wan, charming, discontented face. It occurred to me now that I had seen her, or a picture of her, somewhere before. All right, so this here... Next perception. Of Jordan. Ooh. Right? Good looking, but a little strained. Wayne, charming, but discontent. You live in West Egg, she remarked contemptuously. Now, why contemptuously? Because Jordan is old money, and old money looks down on new money, right? And that's where all the new money is in West Egg. Well, I don't know a single. Well, you must know Gatsby. And here is the first mention of our title character, right? Jordan says, well, you have to know Gatsby. Gatsby? Demanded Daisy. What Gatsby? Before I could reply that he was my neighbor, dinner was announced. Look at this now. Also, wedging his tense arm imperatively under mine, Tom Buchanan compelled me from the room as though he were moving a checker to another square. And this is where we are going to stop for now. Next up, dinner with the Buchanan.